In its series of Sunday afternoon concerts, the CBC presents the second of two programs by Glenn Gould. The soloists in today's program are Julius Bake, flute, Oscar Shumsky, violin, and the distinguished countertenor Russell Oberlin. extraordinary things about history's most extraordinary musician is the fact that this man's music which exerts such a magnetic attraction for us today and against which we tend to measure much of the achievement in the art of music in the last two centuries that this music had absolutely no effect on either the musicians or the public of his own day and the strange thing about Bach is that he doesn't at all fit our conception of the misunderstood genius who was years ahead of his time. He was certainly misunderstood, but not because he was ahead of his time. Rather, because according to the musical disposition of that day, he was generations behind it. To write a fugue like the one I just played was already becoming as old-fashioned in Bach's time as it, it would be if one were to sit down and start writing symphonies in the manner of Max Rager today. And Bach, as he grew older, not only made no attempt to reconcile his thought with the temper of his times, but in fact withdrew into what must have seemed to his contemporaries surely as a maddening nostalgia for the glories of ages past. For Bach, you see, was music's greatest nonconformist and one of the supreme examples of that independence of the artistic conscience that stands quite outside the collective historical process. The age of Bach, speaking in a very general sort of way, was what we can now call the age of reason or perhaps an age of reason. There have really been quite a lot of them. It was fundamentally an age in which man struggled against fear, against predeterminacy. It was an age in which he asserted confidently the wonders of science and of human initiative. It was at times an age of hubris, of defiance for the gods. But at its most poetic, it was still an age in which the wonderful utilities of science and the proud genius of man could coexist with the magical, mystical, fearful rites of belief. And so the art and the poetry and the music of the Baroque, at its best, is touched with this feeling of compromise, this conciliation between the will of man and the inexorable power of fate. But even during the lifetime of Sebastian Bach, this vibrant spiritual compromise, which gave such anguish and purpose and passion to his music, became for other artists of his generation ever more difficult to achieve. And slowly but surely, fact and logic, the explainable and the predictable, became the basis of philosophic premise. And by the time of his death, the world was a very different place from that into which he had been born. It was a world which longed to be logical, a world for young men and for young ideas. <laughs> ¶¶ 
When Bach died, it was not he, but rather his sons who were considered to be the masters of music, masters of a music so very different from that which their father had known. It was they and composers like the teenager Joseph Haydn who were soon to lay the groundwork for a new musical style in which all of this scientific optimism, all of this naively logical philosophic thought of their generation would find a counterpart in an art in which the aim would be not the communication of man with God, but rather of man with man, in which those traits of Sebastian Bach which parallel in music the realization of the incredible richness and indefinable complexity of the human estate could find no place. It had become an age in which the focus of musical activity had moved from the church to the theater, in which the new art would rationally reflect a rational world, in which it would be required to deal with probabilities and not to participate in mysteries. This is not to say that the aspiration to transcend the human condition would be forever lost to art. Certainly it's the essence of Beethoven's work, for instance, that we feel him struggling to strike beyond the realization of human potential. But the grandeur of Beethoven resides in the struggle rather than in the occasional transcendence which he achieves. And it might perhaps never again be possible for us to own more than a glimpse of that inordinate state of ecstasy which Sebastian Bach never thought to question. And for a new age, new musical forms, the symphony, and the sonata were the instrumental forms which this aggressive new humanity built to express itself. These were forms which were based primarily upon the simplification and the clarification of the system of what we call tonal harmony. And to these forms came a whole new conception of the role of the musical theme. They used the theme not as something which just was, which permeated every facet of a work as it did in Bach's music, but as something unique, something singularly eventful, something belonging to the moment. This was also the age in which the concepts of a clear, symmetrical musical architecture became paramount. For Bach's sons, the theme was essentially an isolated event, related, propelled into a relationship, really, with other themes, other isolated events, by the device of what is called harmonic modulation, by the family ties of one key to another. And these family relationships were the background against which this new musical architecture built its structures. Now, Bach, unlike his sons, wasn't really searching for concise harmonic definition for the joining relationship of themes. His harmony, his sense of architecture was immensely complex, infinitely richer than that of his sons, really, and fraught with the kind of adventures that hadn't existed in the musical language since Gesualdo in the 16th century, and which didn't exist again until Schoenberg in the 20th. And while his son's music, with its symmetrical pleasure, its measured form, seems to relate somehow to the probabilities of a rational artistic creed. Bach's music, with all its eternally undulating flow of harmonic motion, with all its vast linear complication, seems to suggest somehow the suspended, perpetually transient, unknowing condition of man. One doesn't come to expect great surprises in the music of Bach. One comes across great moments, indescribable technical achievements, but one is not led to expect in the course of a work, any moment, any pronouncement in which the whole work is not involved. In Bach's music, it's the constancy of event, the, the continuous line of development, the certainty of motion which we come to expect and to love. Essentially for Bach, art was a means of expressing that state of belief in which experience could be natively guided, in which only the obstructions and temptations of the world could thwart the immutable totality of existence, in which, however, the necessity to fend against these temptations provoked the drama of human life. It is these temptations and the constant effort which is required to expel them with which the text of the cantata number 54 is concerned. The title of this cantata, which Russell Oglin is going to sing with us in a moment or two, Widerstehe doch der Sünde, roughly translates as um, stand firm against sin or something like that and is very probably by Bach himself. Certainly its musical realization is given an intensely urgent and poignant expression. Its uh, very opening chord is one of the most striking in all of Bach's harmonic arsenal. In fact, coming as it does at the beginning of work, it's just about unprecedented. 
And both of the outer movements of this cantata are full of that wonderful and torturous art of intense cross-relation and suspension, which Bach always reserved for those subjects on which he felt most keenly, most deeply. Stay a dog, there's in the songs to cry. 
Schwert, das uns gut leid, uns hilft. 